case on this morning's docket. It's case number 108666, Fawcett v. Oil Producers, Inc. of Kansas. May it please the court, I am Robert Kirkendall and I represent a small independent Kansas oil and gas producer named Oil Producers in Kansas or OPIC. I would request uh, four minutes for rebuttal. Four minutes is granted. Your Honor, this appeal can be boiled down to the meaning of four words or phrases. Proceeds at the well, deductions, and marketable condition. It's as simple as that. What did the parties intend in an oil and gas lease that provides for royalties based upon proceeds from a sale of natural gas at the well? Does paying royalties based on 100% of all monies the producer received comply with that obligation? Or are there indirect deductions that need to be added to augment that amount. Can we agree that the conservation fees uh, are off the table in this case? We can agree that the conservation fees and taxes are off the table. Those are handled. And so, and by off the table, that means they sh that the conservation fees and the severance tax fees should not have been uh, the, put into the calculation in order to reduce the, well, I'm sorry, take the severance tax off. Yeah. The, the conservation fees should not have been used to reduce the royalty owner's calculation. We understand that is the, the court's decision in Hockett, and, right. and we don't challenge that decision. Here's my problem. You spend so much time talking about how 100% of the proceeds were used to calculate the royalty. But we know that the proceeds come to you in a multifaceted formula that you use to calculate the gas at the wellhead. One of those facets was the conservation fee, which we know shouldn't have been deducted. And I'm not trying to put a, a bad faith onto that. I'm just saying that after Hockett, we know that we can't just rely on, on, the, on the, the check that you get in the mail. Correct. So the royalty owner ought to be able to look at the other facets of the calculation for the sales price to make sure that there's no mischief. Wouldn't you agree with that? That, there, that there's no deduction that should only be the producer's obligation. Your Honor, I think that you're heading down a path that leads to trouble and confusion. I thought I was heading down the path that the amicus one is to go on, which is a prudent operator and all that. We're just trying to figure out what a fair price is for the gas that's coming out of this hole in the ground. That's true. That's and, true. And because you use a multifaceted contract, and because we know from the conservation fee that we can't just rely on um, whatever agreement you entered into with the, the seller, then there has to be the ability to review and on some standard hold accountable what those facets are that are used to calculate the sale price. I mean, we're just trying to figure out what a fair price is, right? and whether you've put anything into the calculation that shouldn't be there. Your Honor, in this particular case, there are no allegations of any funny business or special deals or manipulation of the contract. I didn't read, I, I read the allegations from the motion for summary judgment to say specifically that, that you've got this complicated formula and in making that complicated formula, you added in 
things that were your sole responsibility. Uh, your Honor, in the I, did I get that did I get that part wrong? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, unless everybody in the industry is doing this wrong, that's the only way that the plaintiff succeeds. But that'd get you into what's the test for whether this is a fair price. This is a fair price. Right. What's everybody else doing? And that, that's kind of the prudent operator and whether the gas is in a marketable condition. And, and I'm just and saying all the, those things ought to go into looking at how you calculate the price at the wellhead. And, and, and if you read the plaintiff's response to the Cuyahoga amicus brief, he repeats, he says repeatedly that there's no question OPEC acted as a reasonable operator in entering into the contracts to market the gas. That's off the table. What he wants is to reform the point at which royalties are measured and move it from the agreed point at the well to some far downstream point or multiple points if there are multiple products that are ultimately produced from the gas stream in order to figure out what price should be paid. We think that the, uh, the, that the standard is really set by the lease terms itself. And the lease in this case refers to proceeds from a sale at the well. That makes a great argument and it's been made, it was made in the, in the uh, Hockett, it was made in, in all of those other cases. But uh, the elephant in the room is we have the marketable condition rule. And that's Correct. out there. And uh, are you asking us to overrule the marketable condition rule? Well, I'm asking you to comply with what you stated in Coulter versus Anadarko. It's a question of fact when gas reaches that state that it is in a marketable condition. But the court in Coulter also defined what that marketable condition means. And you stated that it's in a condition to be sold. And we think that is as simple as a marketable condition is. How do you answer uh, uh, Judge McEnany's concurring that just because someone's willing to buy it uh, in crude, raw form doesn't mean it's in marketable condition? And again, I would say that it depends upon what the parties agree to in the lease. Is this a fair agreement to produce a product at the well and agree that that point is the place for determining the value. The parties did pick that point. The gas, if it's sold at the point, the parties said, let's split the proceeds. It, it seems in most of these cases <laughs> that the two parties are talking past each other when you're talking about marketable versus consumable. Uh, it's marketable if someone will buy it but it's not in consume, uh, consumable condition until and, and it gets to the consumer, really. But uh, most of the cases use the interstate well, pipeline as the um, commercially consumable point of entry. Well, Your Honor, and, and if the parties had said, we will pick an index price for the gas produced from this well and base royalties on that, then it might be fair to enforce that bargain. But that's not the bargain in this case. The bargain in this case is we, if it's sold at the well, well, the we real will problem, split the Well, the real problem here is they didn't say we'll give you X amount MCF at the metered well head. They used the formula that did use an index price and worked backwards. That's correct. And so from that, it's difficult for us to tell what is a reallocation of your client's expenses versus simply a price determination and to de and determine, really, is this in marketable condition? Uh, again, but look at what happened here when uh, the court below tried to do that. In Sternberger, you had the situation where the gas was sold at a distant market, and the royalties were to be determined at the well. And the court said, okay, well, where you're selling it off the lease, the producer is entitled to reduce that off the lease price by the cost to get it there in order to reach an at the well value. Now suddenly, when you're contemplating if 
expenses are somehow shifted, we've got this case where the well, the gas is sold at the well, but the court says, no, you've got to apply this off the lease price. And you've got to add to what you get at the well in order to reach that off the lease price. You've what? got to take out the deductions, which are additions to proceeds, in order to reach that amount that you must calculate royalty on. Where are the receipt points? That's the receipt the, points are on the lease. They're near the well. On premises. Where They're the on well premises. Is located. Yes, it, it's it's in standard uh, industry term. It is at the well. We sell what produces, and if you think that that's unfair, then think about how everything works with oil and gas leases. These are mostly Wachter leases. So the parties agreed that if the, lease, the gas is sold off the lease, the royalty is based upon market value at the well. Some so of the leases... So what's the, Council, what's your test for figuring out what the fair price is at the well? If it's sold at the well, it's proceeds. Unless there is some funny business or hanky-panky... And what's the some, test for making sure that there's no funny business or hanky-panky? Does it comply with industry standards? Is it a standard industry uh, type of transaction? Would a prudent operator enter into that? Is there manipulation? Is there something that raises red flags? Are there related parties involved in the transactions? Is it an arm length deal with an unrelated third party person purchasing this gas? The with, difficulty with that, though, isn't it that it takes the royalty owner out of that equation? You've got other parties negotiating that. And well, leaving well the, you, you do, Your Honor. But the agreement is to split whatever comes out of the well between the royalty owner and the operator. And if you do have an agreement, well, and, and if you do it on a percentage basis like oil and gas leases do, You've got the interests of the producer aligning 100% with the interests of the royalty owner. They want to maximize that check that they get every month. Well, that's, no, that's not, not, not if there's a finite amount. I mean, they're, in comp they're competing interests in terms of when you have an amount. Well, they're competing as to how it gets allocated. But again, if you're talking, you're, you're talking about two things. You're talking about division of pie, and you're talking about the size of the Th pie. That's my point. They're, and, they're aligned in terms of increasing the size of the pie, well, but not in dividing it. And the lease divides the pie. Well, the revenue side, I agree they're aligned in, in interest on the revenue side because the more the revenue, the seven-eighths is, is going to be more. Correct. Uh, just like the one-eighth. But the problem Correct. is we're talking about the expense side here. For instance, if my farm tenant on a crop share basis... Uh, decides to sell the uh, wheat at the field and get a less price for it than if my tenant hauled it to the elevator, then I'm going to get less money for my one-third of the crop uh, than I would if I got the price at the elevator, but I haven't saved a dime. My tenant, who has a responsibility to haul it to the uh, yeah. elevator, save transportation, so... He has come out ahead. I haven't. And that's where we have the tension here. And that's why we've talked about allocable expenses uh, uh, that, to the uh, producer. And, Your Honor, if your agreement with your tenant said uh, he will deliver you wheat in the field, it's one thing, or wheat at the elevator, it's another. You've allocated those expenses that way. It's the same way here. The agreement with the operator or the producer says, unless he says, we will give you proceeds split at the well. You know, as gas makes its way from the well to the burner, it receives the benefit of all sorts of services along the way. In each of those instances, whether, where it's gathered and processed and dehydrated and compressed and treated, it gains value from that activity. That value is as much of a result of the process as it is the natural product. And if you base royalty obligation on this downstream price, 
you are basing royalty on the enhanced value and giving them a royalty on all the investment and industry that it took to take the gas from the wellhead. I can accept that point. What I'm still struggling with, though, is whether or not expenses that should be on that downstream side are getting shifted over and, and being masked as looking as pre-wellhead cell uh, the, yeah. expenses. And how do we, how, and making that determination. Well, uh, again, the expenses that the lessee agrees. You know, we are oil producers in Kansas. We're a small company. Our job consists of finding oil and gas reserves in the ground, drilling wells, bringing it up, and selling the products as close to the wellhead as we can. That's our production expenses. That is what we do. We make agreements with the, the, the uh, lessees, uh, the landowners, to split the proceeds from what we get out of our industry. Those are the production expenses that the operator should bear. The expenses of compression, dehydration processing, those are activities that we don't engage in. We don't have affiliates that own processing plants. There are huge economies of, sale, of scale from making those type of plants huge and uh, congregating all sorts of gas through that. There's an entire industry devoted to those aspects. What we're talking about is selling gas in a different market at the well in a raw condition and that is perfectly acceptable and it is common and that's the way most gas is sold in the industry we I'm, don't think that there are any expenses that are improperly shifted in this if we sell the gas in the condition it is as it comes out of the ground at the well and split what we get and all Doesn't, i care about is what is, is making sure that we define the test that says, how do we identify if you've moved over a cost that shouldn't have been moved? I mean, yeah. I understand what you're saying about processing and moving it on, and we've had a lot of stuff about that. Yeah. And that's fine for purposes of my question. I just want to make sure that I understand that, that we all agree that there needs to be a test to decide what things are being deducted. I, I, I thought in culture, what was nice about that case was it articulated the uh, district court's pretrial uh, questions, when, which was, are you deducting? Mm -hmm. And if so, what's that deduction for? And, I'm, and that's really what I'm getting at. And if it's something that's a processing downstream, you would talk about that, but making sure that you didn't sneak something, I'm, and I don't mean to be Catholic. Something didn't get into the other side, like conservation fees. You thought you could share it with people, turned out you couldn't, but it's in this formula, so we got to be able to move it out. And so I think I heard you say that the prudent operator rule can be a part of that test. I, I think so, Your Honor. And as I understand that test, that includes an obligation to work both on the behalf of the royalty owner as well as the producer. You have to keep both in mind. Correct. As you're going forward. Okay. Correct. And is that inherently a factual issue for the court to apply that test? I mean, can is it subject to summary judgment? Um, I, I do think that it is inherently a factual issue, and, and it does need uh, um, And if you look at that, if every contract is subject to the uh, prudent operator test, and it should be, and if it's challenged as not being prudent, then yes, that is a factual issue. That doesn't lend itself well to summary judgment. Here, remember, there is no question about the prudence or imprudence of the contracts. They're accepted for what they are as prudent contracts by OPEC. Any further questions? I have one, just to help me understand sort of the economics of this, and I want to rewind all the way back to okay. the expectations of these parties when they enter into a lease. Yes. Does the marketability rule or the pipeline ready rule, does that create an expectation on the part of the uh, royalty owner 
that the price on which their royalty will be calculated is the price that that is received for pipeline ready product well i i would say your honor that if you affirm what the court did below which appears to be the first court to hold as a matter of law that this duty exists then it might become a part of the accepted belief on what people would want well my understanding is that's what the plaintiffs are arguing that that was part of their expectation but you would dispute that yeah they have not found any case any place prior to the court of appeals decision below that held that to meet the obligation to produce a marketable product, you've got to produce interstate pipeline quality gas and compress it and transport it to a location where it can be sold. That's nowhere to be found in any of the cases. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, Council, I, I want to get back to your statement that you didn't believe it was in dispute uh, about the plaintiff's allegation, and I'm looking at plaintiff's opposition to the motion for partial sum to your motion for partial summary judgment. And here it says OPEC uses those contracts, those being the gas purchase agreements, to perform its implied covenant to place the gas into marketable condition. Now that allegation, when I read it, is saying to me that you have parts of your sales price formula that are covering your obligations, like a conservation well, fee versus that. So that's why, I'm, in, that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. In, in the plaintiff's world, marketable condition equals interstate pipeline quality. So it, we do not produce raw gas, does not generally, and in this case I don't believe, it meets interstate okay. pipeline quality as it emerges. So it is the plaintiff's position that all of the service that it receives from the time it leaves the well to the time it hits an interstate pipeline are part of our obligation, and we dispute that. Any further questions? Just, just a factual question so I can understand it. The, the buyers, your buyers, are like midstream operators that take it from you, move it down, but they don't ultimately put it in the interstate. Some of them might. Some do. Some of them might. We'd but we'd some of them may just be interim, like in my example, be the person that hauled it to the elevator or, or you know, whatever. Some uh, of them might be marketers and they might move it in different ways. But, they might remarket. But they would have to, even if they're midstream, they, they would still have to expend money to uh, move it along move the gas along through the pipeline. Uh, the, it, it would cost the, them money to take it from your, uh, from the wellhead and move it to uh, 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 extraction uh, Absolutely. Facility. Okay. Absolutely. Any more questions? Thank you, Council. May it please the court. Rex Sharp for the plaintiff class of royalty owners. Marketable condition is about quality. It's not about title transfer. It's not about a gas contract. All of the marketable condition rule cases are about the physical services needed, the gathering compression, dehydration treatment and processing services needed to physically transform and segregate the gas into marketable condition which is why there's only one real objective price that can be had on these, these products. Index price, which is at the interstate pipeline, and opus, which is for fractionated natural gas liquids. That's proven time and time again through almost everything in evidence in this case. But let's start with the gas contracts themselves. Those gas contracts define that particular marketable condition because until you get to that marketable condition and all of the midstream services that are necessary under the gas contracts have been performed, until that's done, you can't get a price. There's no value that you can get. You can't go back and deduct anything. The starting price is always a fair market value price. 
What about and the argument that it is marketable for many purposes? It, it can be sold. It can be sold down hole. It can be sold truly at the wellhead. It can be sold after the separator and before the gathering line inlet. It can be sold after the gathering line inlet for local use, but it can't be sold into the interstate market, which is the reason the wells are drilled. But, the, but does that ignore the wellhead, the, the words wellhead in the contract? No, the at the well argument has been made multiple times in multiple jurisdictions. All of the, te the, the law that follows Texas says, well, that's a place for valuation and we're just going to let all of the net back go. All of the marketable condition rule states say at the well is silent or ambiguous as to whether you can t take any deductions and therefore we're not going to allow deductions. It's interesting, but all of the marketable condition rule states and the Texas uh, law is similar in that they're all or nothing. They're all or nothing in this midstream category of gathering, compression, dehydration, treatment, and processing. So okay. what, what you really are saying that uh, commercially you can't have anyone that uh, uh, produces at the wellhead and sells to midstream people because uh, uh, they're going to have to pay all of the, uh, the cost uh, of the people that they sell it to uh, to move it downstream. So you've just, you, you've just uh, eliminated uh, as a matter of financial uh, uh, reality, anyone from uh, operating the way OPEC is operating right now? No, uh, they they have the right to operate however they wish. Well, for instance, uh, financially, they can't they can't pay all the costs to the internet interstate and not receive uh, uh, the the benefit because they're not getting any of that money. Yeah, they're, all they're getting is what they're selling for at the wellhead less the transportation. So, what uh, as a, a matter of, of public policy, why do we want to uh, restrict uh, small operators being able uh, to do that? Large operators and small operators operate under the same law, and that law is that they have the right to exercise their own prerogative under the prudent operator standard that I th think uh, was mentioned previously to generate as much revenue as they wish. If they'd like to put in their own gathering system or their own processing plant, right. they can but do the, that. But that's a court-made rule. It's not. You can't read that into the, the into the lease, can you? It is a court-made rule. The and, implied and, marketable and what's 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 the rationale behind it? Uh, uh, let's use a, a, a dairy producer. Uh, you know, you sell milk at the farm, but uh, uh, you don't get the benefit of the value of that milk after it's been homogenized, pasteurized, you've been separated out in butter, cream, and all that. You don't get that benefit in that scenario. So what, 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 what's the, the rationale for giving the landowner the benefit of all the production costs, the extraction of the helium and all that, that kind of thing, um, when it was just uh, uh, they agreed to sell it off the farm? Well, the reason for the marketable condition rule is that they have to produce a marketable product, not that they just have to produce raw gas, which is unusable and can't it's, be used. It's in not market. unusable. It's saleable, and marketable means you can market it. You're talking about consumable, it, which is different than marketable. But we've we've uh, intertwined those concepts. Uh, now the mar in your uh, explanation, marketable means consumable. Marketable means it has to be of a quality that many buyers and many sellers can use as a fungible product in a transparent market so that you have an actual quality so that everybody can bid and, and sell the same thing. That doesn't happen at the well. can't happen at the well because there's only one operator to sell. There's only one gatherer to buy. There's not multiple gathering lines that come to a well. There's no transparency at all because the confidential gas contracts preclude that possibility, and the raw gas is so variable that there's no fungibility. Why isn't that a function of the prudent operator rule? That, that if, if the, the manner in which the producer is, is marketing um, is uh, un, severely unfavorable to the landowner, then it violates that. Prudent, the prudent operator rule is about the revenue side. 
And in the revenue side, they have the right to go forward and, as I indicated, do their own gathering and processing just like BP and Lind Energy do, or do part of it like the gathering like Oxy does, or do none of it like OPIC does. That is their prerogative, and as long as they're entering into gas contracts then, they get that best gross value that they can get for the products that come out of that hole, they have, they have fulfilled their prudent operator standard, which is, in this particular case, not really in question because they have done their job. Look at every gas contract. They get index price. They get opus. That's the, those are the standard fair market values that they can get for those products, and they get them. The problem is they've hired somebody so that they can get everything segregated. In your, your instance, uh, Justice Johnson, they, segre they segregated their milk. The milk has value. The gas has value. Ethane has value. Propane has value. CO2 doesn't have value. Nitrogen doesn't have much value. So con consequently, everything has to be separated into their market value categories, just like oil is. Oil is easily, more easily separated. All you have to do is drain off the liquid and you have market value oil. That's not true for natural gas because the gas is all commingled. Until you have each of those things into a marketable condition, you can't really get a marketable condition price. It is usable and in many instances it will burn, not efficiently, but it will burn and in fact it could burn and could be very dangerous. But in marketable condition, it's a merchantable product, fungible for everybody at the index price, for everybody at the interstate pipeline quality, and everybody at opus price, at opus price for NGLs, ethane, propane, everything's fungible. That's their duty. It's not just to lift it to the ground, that's the Texas rule. It's to lift it to, to the ground and then make a marketable product. So that's the marketable, the marketable condition, condition rule. rule just wipes out any reference to at the well right. in the contract. No, no, it doesn't. The at the well concept is silent as to deductions. There are express deduction leases. There have been numerous express deduction leases in Kansas. This, uh, the, the court probably saw that in the Farrar case. I know this court didn't take that case, but Exxon back in the 1970s and 1980s entered into express deduction leases that continued to have the at the well language because at the well means you're going to pay for what comes out at the well. It's not a valuation point. It is what comes up at, at the well. That's the valuable products that you have to pay for once they are put into marketable condition. Exxon in that particular case, in the Farrar case, had expressed deduction leases that said, we're going to pay you proceeds at the well minus gathering, compression, dehydration, treatment, processing, and other marketing costs to make the gas merchantable. Pretty simple, very clear. Entered into a contract with the person that matters. Not a gas contract that's confidential from royalty owners, but one directly with the royalty owners that says, if you, this is what I'm gonna deduct, do you agree? Yes, I agree, I sign right here on the lease. Not coming out later on with a gas contract that's confidential and the royalty owners never see. It is, you can deduct that. And that's what an express deduction lease is all about. This issue has already been decided in Sternberger, the at the well issue and the at the well language. But it's been decided in Sternberger and every other marketable condition rural state has faced this issue. West Virginia faced it recently. Colorado faced it a long time ago in the Garmin case. Oklahoma has faced it in the Middlestack case. Almost all of them follow the majority rule, which is the marketable condition rule. There are some states that follow the Texas rule. They would like to advocate the Texas rule, but you would have to overrule Sternberger to get there, and you would have to take Kansas law for the last 50 years, in which the expectations of the parties have been well known, Royalty owners don't suffer any deductions. They only get one-eighth or three-sixteenths of all of the value of the minerals that come up at the well. The, all the rest of it goes to the lessee. So the lessee has the obligation to do something. They have the obligation to market. And when they have that obligation, because the royalty owners don't have any idea how to market, the industry knows how to market. They have the expertise. They have the manpower, they have the money to market, and they have the cost to do that marketing. 
the royalty owner has only one thing underground his minerals and once those minerals are gone they're going to move on OPIC Exxon BP all of them will move on and the royalty owner will be left with nothing so it's very important that the royalty owner get his full one eighth or three sixteenths not diminished by costs to make the gas into marketable condition. Let's assume the gas purchase agreement in, in this case said that, uh, oh, I don't know, let's just use uh, One Oak. Uh, One Oak will pay a fixed price, X. So how would you go about doing what you do on behalf of royalty owners to make sure that X is a fair price? In your scenario, One Oak says, we'll pay you $3 for uh, whatever comes out of the hole. And after that, we'll take it and go from there. Well, you would go back and you say, how much, uh, how much residue gas methane came out of that hole? Because we'll need the gas analysis. And we'll also need to know how much ethane, propane, butane, isobutane, uh, pentane came out of that hole. Again, the gas analysis will show you. And then you would go to the objective fair market value, which would be the index price, which you could find at the Pan and Eastern Pipeline uh, index price. And you'd say, that's what I'm going to get for the residue, however much came out of that hole. That's what I'm going to get for the opus on eth ethane, propane. It's all sold at the Conway price. And just multiply it out. That's the number the royalty is paid on. Very simple, very objective. And that might end up being a really great deal for OPIC to do something like that. Or it might be a really bad deal. Most of the time, they don't want to do that kind of thing because of the fluctuation in price. For instance, what if they just sold oil uh, for $100 a barrel and all of a sudden it's 65 uh, You can imagine one side of that equation or the other would be squawking quite a, quite a little bit. But the royalty owner gets an easy to calculate fair market value and it's set forth in the gas contracts. It's shown by, it's defined by economics where you have willing buyers, not just one, many sellers, not just one. You have fungible products, which is at the interstate pipeline or at Conway where ethane and propane are all isolated and segregated. You have transparency so everybody knows. It's, it's, and it's the very first index price. So everything triggers off of that market value price. The FERC also defines what kind of tariff quality they're going to allow. The FERC has to do that so that everybody knows they're getting a minimum quality of gas. And the case law in this, in this state defines it the same way. You always look at those cases and all of them say, the line of demarcation is transportation can be deducted because you've gotten to the interstate pipeline and if you transport on that interstate pipeline and get a city gate price, you're entitled to deduct that value of transportation. But everything getting you up to that transportation line is not deductible because that's what's necessary to get to a marketable condition value. The way you can look at that is Gilmore was a, was a gathering and compression case that, that uh, expense occurred on the lease. Schuchbach came along and the defendants said, well, you know, I'd what if it's off the lease? What if those expenses are incurred to make the gas into marketable condition off the lease? Can't we get a break there? And the court said it doesn't matter where it's done. It matters that it is done to get to the interstate pipeline quality. And then you come by with Sternberger and Sternberger says, if you don't have any of these services, and there was no evidence of services in that case being performed on the gas. If you don't have any gathering, compression, dehydration, treatment, or processing, and they used almost every single one of those terms in the Sternberger case, no evidence of that, it must be transportation that's deductible. Same kind of scenario. If you have those services, and in this case, you have those services for all of the gas every one of them spelled out in the gas contracts as to exactly what they're going to be charged for and what's necessary to reach that marketable condition value. I'm just having trouble understanding the economic sense of that argument. Um, back to if I am a supplier of a component that is later enhanced by additional services um, or other products are added to it for a final manufactured product, 
I don't get to ask for that manufactured price. I get to ask what the fair market value is for the component that I'm adding to this stream of service and processing. You're exactly right, Your Honor. And that's, that is the marketable condition rule and the enhancement doctrine. The enhancement doctrine comes behind the marketable condition rule. So once the gas is in marketable condition, everything that you do after that, by, for instance, transporting it on the interstate pipeline to get to a city... Raw material that comes out of the ground. Right. Am I not just stuck with that? And the fact that there may not be a large market price for that is just an inherent part of the product that I, am, I own. Um, why does that change here? I mean, I, maybe I think I'm probably going to the, trying to understand the policy of the market condition rule, but Cor correct. I, I just don't understand why that person is stuck with whatever that is and doesn't get the, the benefit of the enhancements that get it ready to put into the pipeline. The, the raw gas or raw ore or whatever it is that's raw, that's a commodity that comes out of the ground, has to be processed and segregated into something that's fairly pure, like it, methane or it, it ethane. It doesn't have to. It has to be done. The question is, it, who's going to do it? Does it? it? Isn't it usable at that site for some purposes? It could be used. Not for it, mass purposes. It, but Correct. Some. It could be used, say, for in the local market for house gas. Sometimes it's used for house gas in the lease. There is a provision for house gas. It's not a sale, but it's used. Uh, irrigation gas, same thing. It can be used for irrigation gas, not in efficiently, fact, but it can In fact, be. in Coulter, that was part of the evidence that it came off. In fact, I think that was part of the opinion is that it was usable. So it, uh, it seems Correct. to me what your answer is a matter of degree. You're enhancing over and above house use and irrigation to get interstate, and, but but that's not an enhancement. But if you enhance past that, then it is deductible. Correct. So, so uh, I, I think I have the same question as Justice Lukert. How are, why are we drawing the line at a particular place on the enhancement continuum? Because it is the lessee's job to make it a marketable product because quite frankly, the royalty owner doesn't know how and they're not engaged in that process, and they're not even consulted in that process on how to do it. Uh, so it is the lessee's job to make it a marketable product. It has to be done. The question is, who's going to do it? And it's always placed on the lessee because they have the, the experience, the knowledge, and the capital to get that done. And I, who's going to pay for it? I, I doubt if many dairy farmers know how to homogenize and pasteurize and, and take it in that context of uh, why it's allowable uh, that they don't get those enhancements, but a landowner does. Yeah, in this, in this particular case, you have the marketable condition rule. These aren't just your plain, ordinary contracts. These are, uh, these are leases that affect the minerals and can go on for a lifetime, uh, actually multiple lifetimes. And so you, you have to take some of these really old contracts that are not crystal clear and do not have express deduction leases and decide who's going to end up paying for that cost because we know the cost is going to be incurred to make these these products into marketable condition and this court since even before Sternberger way before Gilmore it already addressed this issue that Justice Luker uh, brought up in the Eli versus Wichita natural gas case back in 1916 where it said for, for natural gas usable is not the test. Usable just because it'll burn or provide light is not the test. It's a quality test and that quality is set by the market or it's set by FERC, the minimum standard that has to be met. And those are the standards and the objective fair market value that the royalty owners are entitled to under the marketable condition rule. It's very simple. The gas contracts spell that out. All we want is the gross value, not the net value. If there are no further questions. I appreciate you. One final question, counsel, and it's essentially the same question I asked your opposing counsel. I understand the marketable condition rule, and regardless of whether it's a good rule or a bad rule, my question doesn't go to that, but it goes to was that rule so well established 
that it essentially formed part of the party's expectations when they entered into the lease. I don't know if the marketable condition rule was firmly established. Uh, you, you first see it a hundred years ago back in Howerton when it had the implied marketable, uh, implied duty to market as well as the um, implied mutual benefit rule, but it was fairly well known from well into the 40s or 50s that royalty owners didn't pay any cost. They were cost free. And so the attempt to start placing costs on I understand your was, argument, but was the intent. The intent was from the royalty owner's perspective was they weren't going to pay any cost. They didn't have any money. It's you want to come get my minerals. You come, you've got the capital, you have the know-how. You've got all the I understand, well, we but we have pay. a lease here that Correct. we've got to construe. That's Correct, the lower I understand. Court did. And, and I think your opposing counsel is saying, this rule was not so well established that it formed, that it, that it, was, it was sort of well known and, and nobody questioned this. And so therefore it's, you know, it, it can be read into the lease essentially. He's saying, this is new law that, that wasn't around and it wasn't part of my client's expectations. It, it's not new law. Uh, it was certainly around by the time his client even incorporated and started doing business. Um, as I understand that, that happened uh, in this particular case long after Gilmore and long after Schuttbach. But I ask you to take a look at both Gilmore and Schuttbach because the language in the, that, those cases indicate that the standard at that time was that all of those costs were borne by the lessee. None were borne by the royalty owner. And for the first time in Gilmore, they started trying to inch forward and say, uh, we'd like the royalty owner to contribute on gathering. No, nope, that can't be done. And you see that language again in Schuttbach that says, no, that's, there was industry custom not to do that. Now the issue's coming before the court. And I, I would presume that your client, or you would take the position that it was your client's expectation when they entered into the lease that the marketable condition rule would apply. Correct. Royalty owners pay no cost. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I would submit that the marketable condition rule, up until the decision below, meant you had to put the gas in condition to be sold. All of the Kansas cases, all of the Kansas cases dealing with this issue prior to this instant case, talked about amounts that the producer could remove from that first sale price prior to calculating royalty, because they were talking about deductions, and the deductions came from the first sale price. That is what the marketable condition rules. The marketable condition rule on steroids, as advocated by the plaintiffs in this case, changes all the entire industry. All of a sudden, costs that are the midstream companies that never were contemplated to be assumed by the producer are suddenly matters that need to be added into the calculation. They're no longer deductions. We aren't talking about deductions. We're talking about additions to what is received in order to calculate royalty. How does, how, um, the, I think the two authorities your opposing counsel cited were Eli and the FERC rule to say, no, we had to look at some more of a quality analysis. Do you have a response to that? Uh, the, 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 the FERC rule does not really apply. The FERC rule requires that interstate pipelines post tariffs that set quality standards for what they will accept in their pipeline. They vary from pipeline to pipeline to pipeline. We don't know what standard you're talking about in order to inject into any given pipeline. Uh, the, the other standards that he cited were things like uh, COPAS prices. Those are standard industry prices for segregated products that happen distant, far distant from the well. And they have nothing to do with anything that our oil company is doing in the field to drill wells, to produce gas, and to sell what we get up at the surface. Uh, Again, the point I want to make now is the point I started with. 
This case is about the meaning of certain words used in an oil and gas lease. The law of contracts applies the usual and ordinary rules to determine those disputes. The starting point is the intent of the parties and the contract language. Uh, Kansas courts have always let the parties in a contractual relationship be the ones to set the rules. In, even in the past with oil and gas leases, the court has imposed covenants only when it fulfills the expectations of the parties, the intent of the parties. The fundamental process has changed with the enforcement of oil and gas leases in this case. Instead of letting the party's intent control or interpreting the contract to find out what that intent was, the courts below imposed a covenant on that, that completely shifted the agreement of the parties. If implied covenants can be imposed as a matter of law to restrike the bargain between an oil producer and a landowner, then basic contractual principles can no longer be relied upon, at least in the oil and gas industry. OPEC maintains that what happened in this case is nothing less than a complete rewriting of the royalty obligations in not only the leases in this case, but in all of the Kansas uh, leases. And in undertaking this process, the court erred. The court should reverse the decisions below and hold that contract principles do apply to oil and gas leases and the intent of the parties controls and that should control this case. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. This time the court is in recess for 15 minutes.